These are the oldest stories online at oldeststories.net. Today we begin a new period in Mesopotamian history, one which will run from 2004 BCE until 1531 BCE and feature Amorite dominance, political fragmentation, and an explosion of culture, or at least culture which survives to modern times and thus can be retold on a podcast. This period will see Isin, Larsa, Assyria, and finally Hammurabi's Babylon all rise to greatness and leave their mark upon the region. But to properly understand this new era, we're going to need to introduce new gods and new stories. Many of these are dated to sometime around 1800 or 1700 BCE, but naturally the new gods and ideas are already swirling around with the settlement of the Amorites in Sumer and Akkad at the very beginning of the period. And so where better to start than at the beginning, with the work that has been famously called the Babylonian creation myth, the Enuma Elish. To think of it as a singular canon work akin to the book of Genesis would be mistaken, since as we'll see there are many accounts of creation given over the years, but this is the one that features Marduk, who will be a chief god from now on, all the way in fact into the History of Persia podcast when the excellent Trevor Cully will mention him being patronized by Cyrus the Great 1500 years from now. This is also one that will persist far longer than much of Mesopotamian culture, being cited in the Seleucid period and even having mentions from just before the Islamic invasions. Though I have been careful up to this point to keep the Enuma Elish out of the Sumerian period, there are many familiar elements from Sumerian myths that we've already encountered, and this represents a fusion of Amorite, Sumerian, and Akkadian cultures. One of the biggest mistakes people make, however, is to look at the extreme antiquity of the Enuma Elish and backdate it all the way to the beginning of civilization. This is wrong, and as we can by now appreciate, this work did not even exist until Sumerian civilization was basically extinguished. So it can be called the Babylonian creation myth, and fairly, if a bit confusingly, a Mesopotamian creation myth, but it is not, though commonly cited to be, a Sumerian myth. But what of the story itself? It is seven tablets, copies and fragments of which have been found from numerous places and times over the centuries, with some of our most complete copies being from much later, and some from Assyria, telling the same tale but substituting the later god Assur as the hero instead of Marduk. Apart from these Assyrian modifications, however, the various copies are remarkably consistent, likely due to the fact that this story would be read aloud each year at the Akitu festival, which marked the new year. The fifth tablet has a fair bit of damage and has only been partially reconstructed, but aside from that, the narrative is in excellent shape considering its age. It begins with the words, Enuma Elish, when on high beginning at the very beginning of time, when on high the heavens above were not yet named, nor earth below pronounced by name. Apsu, the first god, and Tiamat, the mother, lived in a space of nothingness, without pastures or reed beds, or gods or names or destinies. And so the two of them mingled their waters together, birthing the first four gods, Lamu and Lahamu, Anshar and Kishar, each growing to maturity and speaking their names aloud for the first time. Anshar and Kishar gave birth to Anu, also called An, the first name we should recognize from previous episodes. An then gave birth to Nudimud, an unfamiliar name for a familiar fellow, the god of waters and wisdom, Ea. An was the equal of all four of the previous generation, and Ea, being both strong and exceedingly wise, was greater than his father or grandfather's. A bunch of other gods were born too. And all of these new gods would get together and basically party all day, since what else are you going to do in a floating void? 
All their noise and activity stirred up the waters and made a bunch of noise and began to irritate the original two gods, who were used to the calm silence of nothingness. The mother, Tiamat, was inclined to indulge them, even though she was definitely irritated. But the father, Apsu, yelled at them to be quiet. But in the manner of rowdy teens in any time or place, they just ignored the elders, deciding that they were uncool party poopers. Finally, Apsu summons his advisor, Momu. All the gods, we should note, have these sorts of ministers or advisors or hangers-on, uh, usually one per god, and they're never really explained. They just sort of follow the god wherever it goes. So when this advisor Mumu shows up, Apsu says that it is time to go have a meeting with Tiamat about this issue. So they float over to Tiamat and Apsu says, This is intolerable. How am I going to get any sleep around here when these kids are playing their hip-hop music and twerking all the time? I vote that we murder them all so that we can enjoy nap time again. Tiamat, however, was horrified at the suggestion of postnatal abortion. Enraged, she screamed that she couldn't possibly destroy what they had given life to, and that Apsu needed to be more patient and understanding with these children. Advisor Mamu, however, did not agree with Tiamat's benevolence, and once they were out of earshot, Mamu whispered into Apsu's ear, saying, Listen. You heard the strain in her voice. It would be doing her a favor to quiet this noise and let her sleep. She really wants you to do it. She's just too embarrassed to say so. And with this validation, Apsu was so delighted that he hugged Mumu, and Mumu climbed up on Apsu's lap, and they kissed. But secrecy hadn't been invented yet, and all the young gods heard about Apsu's plan to kill them all. They fell silent and still for the first time since creation, cowed by fear. But this was a total buzzkill, and Ea, the wisest, didn't put up with anyone turning the music down. So he hatched a plan. Step one was a magic spell to put Apsu and Mamu to sleep, executed flawlessly. Step two was to steal Apsu's crown and mantle of radiance for himself, also done without a hitch. Step three was to murder Apsu and Mamu in their sleep, again, zero problems. Step four was to cry out in triumph. And with this, bing bang boom, mission accomplished. He sets himself up in a palace with his lover Damkina, who is sometimes equated with Ninhursag. Where did this palace come from? It was carved from the corpse of Apsu. What else could be more regal? They're living inside of a dead body. Then the two of them got to reproducing and produced Marduk. The poet repeats that a few times since it is important and they want you to remember it. Marduk was born inside Apsu, the first god, from the god of wisdom, and thus is wisest of all. Marduk was suckled by goddesses, and the nurse who reared him, quote, filled him with awesomeness. His form was proud, his gaze penetrating, and his strength great right from the start. And when his grandfather An first laid eyes on the boy, he was overjoyed. Marduk was so perfect, in fact, that he had double the amount of godhood that anyone else had and was elevated above the other gods right from the get-go. His limbs were so amazing as to be incomprehensible, like literally difficult to look at. They were so cool. And he had four eyes and four ears and a mouth that spewed fire, and he was quite tall as well. And he had some sort of godly jewelry that floated over his head with more glory than ten normal gods, and beams of light radiated all around like a divine, almighty disco ball. His grandfather gave him the four winds as a toy to play with, and everyone was just standing around discussing how amazing this new kid was. And with all this hubbub and to-do of a child playing with wind and all the gods partying, the commotion was worse than ever. 
Even some of the other gods were getting sick of it, and they went up to Tiamat, who also couldn't sleep, and they said, Why are you putting up with this? They killed your lover and his advisor, and now they're causing more disruption than ever. And Tiamat looked at them for a while before saying, You know what? You are absolutely right. This whole creating life thing was a big mistake, and I'm going to fix it right now. Tiamat and her ally gods schemed and convened councils and began to create fearsome demon weapons. She made snakes with venom instead of blood, and godlike dragons that shot out beams of light, a horned serpent, a mushushu dragon, whatever that is, a lamu hero, an ugalu demon, a rabid dog, a scorpion man, umu demons, fishmen, and bullmen. Then she made eleven more demons who were either too horrifying to record or too boring to remember. She promoted a god named Kingu to be the general of her army and gave him magic spells to be the strongest of all gods. Then, to ensure his loyalty, she took him as her lover and set upon him the throne of kingship, handing him the legendary Tablet of Destinies so he would have power over all of fate itself. This is the end of Tablet 1. Clearly they had developed a better sense of narrative structure and suspense building compared to the older Sumerian literature. Tablet 2 begins with Tiamat gathering up this newly created army to ready them for war. Ea gets a report in his palace made of the corpse of his dead great-grandfather, -grand great-grandfather... Anyway, Ea gets a report that an army is massing and is completely shocked. The god of wisdom is unable to figure out why someone might be upset that he killed her husband and is making such a racket that no one's been able to sleep for weeks. And so he runs to his grandfather and Shar and informs them that Tiamat is bringing an army to kill them all. An army of chimerical monsters, so horrifying to look at that just seeing them will cause anyone to collapse in utter terror. Ea reports the activities from the end of Tablet 1 for the benefit of his grandfather and anyone in the audience who had maybe gone to the bathroom during the reading of the previous tablet. Remember that, though this is written down, the surviving tablets were really not meant to be read like a novel. Rather, they were meant as notes or memory aids, and the performer was meant to fill out the story with his own flourishes and drag out the story for a few hours. I will try to keep us around 30 minutes, though. When Anshar hears all this, his liver begins to shrivel up, and his voice loses all volume, and he says, Uh, uh, you started this, a, uh... It's all your fault. I don't know anything. I'm just an innocent bystander. And Anshan began to twiddle his thumbs and whistle tunelessly. But Ea was too clever for that, offering some soothing flattery to get Anshan back on his side. Then remind him that if he hadn't killed Apsu, they would already all be dead. This monster army, though, is a new and greater threat and required the greatest of gods. That includes you, O oh mighty Anshan. The flattery pleased Anshan, and he was convinced that Ea had done the right thing, so he offers some advice. Go up to Tiamat. Calm her down with some soothing words. Ea says, this sounds pretty good, and he starts walking up to Tiamat. But then he sees that she looks super angry and is absolutely surrounded by horrifying demons. And Aya goes back to rethink his options. He tells Anshan that, in fact, it, it was very scary, but, but, that Anshan should definitely send someone else, because surely any woman can be defeated by a man. So just send over someone to confuse her armies and calm her down. But not me. So Anshan calls his son An, the firstborn of the major gods, and he exhorts him as the heroic mace of the gods, with mighty strength, to go and confront Tiamat, or calm her down, or defeat her, or whatever. And so An starts walking toward Tiamat, but, you know, she really does look angry, and those, those sure are a lot of demons. 
So he returns to his father and says, ah, you know what? Tiamat is, is really quite frightening to me personally, but any woman can be defeated by just any man. So definitely just send someone else to take care of it and it'll be no problem. Just not me. Anshan was speechless, shaking his head at the two gods, who were in that moment the high gods of making excuses instead of getting things done. All the lesser gods, the Igigi, were assembled, and all the high gods, the Anunnaki, were assembled, and Anshan just sat there in silence, till finally he despaired. Will no one step up and take care of this, he cried out. In just that moment, from a hidden corner of the meeting room, a voice cried out, accompanied by a band playing a jingle like the theme song for a cartoon hero. This was Ea, though no one noticed through the bombast. Whose heart is perfect? Who is the mighty champion? Who rushes fearlessly into battle? Marduk the hero! And the spotlight kicked on, picking out Marduk from among the crowd of gods. This fed his vanity, so swept up in the moment, Marduk lightly jogged up on the stage as a path cleared before him like a contestant on The Price is Right. He came up to Anshar's throne and kissed him on the lips. Then with confidence he addressed the eldest, saying, Why are you silent? Open your mouth and order me into battle. Anshar asked, Who put you up to this, Marduk? Don't you know that it is Tiamat, the representation of womankind, who you will be facing with her many mighty armies? Marduk replied, Chill, I got this. Soon you will have your foot on Tiamat's neck. Anshan sighed, but didn't see any other volunteers, and said, Go then, take the chariot of storms, and make all haste to quell Tiamat's anger. All right, said Marduk, here we go. I am going off to take care of this. I will be the champion and save everyone's lives. It is going to be great. Ah, paused Marduk. But wait, before I go, there is one little thing, just a teensy-weensy little thing that I will need first. All I need, and it isn't much, surely you don't mind. All I want is supreme kingship and power over fate itself that my command can never be changed or opposed. The end of Tablet 2 is sadly fragmented after this, but where Tablet 3 picks up, Anshan is calling to his advisor, Kaka. He instructs his advisor to gather all the gods. I thought they were already gathered, but clearly not. All of the gods needed to be told of this terrible threat of Mother Tiamat coming to destroy everyone. And they needed to be told that Marduk was going to take care of it for him. But everyone has to come to a ceremony first to make Marduk the supreme god of the universe. Kaka listens to the summary of the whole story up until now, then runs over and re-summarizes the story for Lamu and Lahamu and all the gods around them. If you would like the story re-summarized, you can just go back to the beginning of the episode and listen again. The lesser gods start to get upset. They had no idea until just now that there was anything wrong at all, and so everyone begins to pile into the massive banquet hall. Once the lesser gods are there and the great gods parade in, everyone's kissing each other and feasting and getting terribly drunk. And at the climax of the feast, they all use their collective god powers to make Marduk the supreme god over everything forever. This takes the whole of Tablet 3. When Tablet 4 opens, the various gods have put together a princely shrine, on top of which is enthroned Marduk. The gods all give a big chant about how great and wonderful Marduk is. They name him as champion of the gods and sovereign over the whole universe. They then pray for him to have good aim and a strong arm, because he was about to need it. Then, as an example, they set up a constellation in the skies. They then tell Marduk to speak and make it disappear. He commands it to disappear, let the light be gone, and poof, gone. They then urge him to make it reappear, and he speaks, Let there be light, and poof, back again. 
Incidentally, this creation through words will become the model for later Assyrian and Jewish chief gods, since both would be inheriting the core of their culture during this Amorite period of history. Anyway, Marduk makes some stars pop in and out until he gets bored, and having confirmed his supremacy over the universe, it is time for war, or as Marduk calls it, the path of peace and obedience, beating George Orwell by just shy of 4,000 years with the concept of doublespeak. Marduk then creates his weapons, each massive and fit for his hand alone. A mighty bow, his primary weapon, and a quiver of well-crafted arrows are slung on his back. His reserve weapon, a one-handed mace, is at his hip, and so far he looks quite like a standard Amorite noble warrior. But then he also arms himself with a lightning bolt and fills his body with fire, he creates a massive war net to catch Tiamat, and he summons the four winds to be his servants, north, south, east, and west. To these four winds, he adds the evil wind, the tempest, and the tornado, making him the master of seven winds. These winds he releases to wreak havoc and announce the beginning of the war as he steps onto his storm chariot. It isn't clear to what he hitched his chariot, since honestly it isn't always clear what animal is used historically. Possibly an onager, some other donkey or mule, but this is even less clear in the mythological context where we are filled with strange beasts. But we know that whatever they are, their names are Slayer, Pitiless, Racer, and Flyer rather more awesome than the pullers of Santa's sleigh. Whatever they are, their teeth are poisoned. They know not exhaustion. They can only devastate. Marduk stands clothed in awesome armor and wearing a radiant crown. On his lips sat a magic spell, and in his left hand he held herbs to counter poison as he faced down the road toward Tiamat and began forward. All the lesser gods are in a disorganized mob, parading behind him. Finally, Marduk reached the site of battle, looking into the middle of Tiamat, trying to figure out from the disposition of forces what Kingu's strategy is going to be. But as he looks more and more at Kingu and his fearsome monsters, he begins to get lightheaded and his mind grew confused. Catching this weakness, Tiamat used womanly magic, which the epic helpfully clarifies is lies and deceit, to try and take Marduk out in a single stroke. He wavered upon his chariot, and all the gods who followed him grew worried for a moment. But Marduk withstood this mental pressure, and he held his battle mace high, calling to Tiamat. Why all the tricks? Why this army? Just because your sons were noisy and disrespected their fathers, should you, our mother, reject compassion? By seeking evil for Anshar, king of gods, and appointing this beast Kingu to godly status, you are the one who has wronged us. Let your army prepare, for I challenge you to glorious single combat. At this provocation, Tiamat flew into a rage, screaming and charging at Marduk. Marduk circled carefully, and soon he had an opening to toss his net and ensnare her. She opened her mouth to scream, but in that moment Marduk shot the evil wind into her mouth and forced it open further. All the winds entered her and tore up her insides, swelling her with wind. A single strong bowshot split open her distended stomach and punched clean into her heart, extinguishing her life in a swift and vicious stroke. With Tiamat slain, Marduk charged his chariot into the mass of enemy monster soldiers, and, demoralized, they dispersed quickly, with the beasts slain and the rebel gods merely captured and imprisoned. Kingu, he ran down from atop his chariot and slew, taking the wrongfully given Tablet of Destinies from his cold, dead fingers. And as he walked back to the mob of other gods, with the Tablet of Destinies secure in his arms, he passed again by the corpse of Tiamat and smashed its neck with his mace just to make the blood flow a little bit more. Then he sliced her in half and put half of her up in the sky and assigned a guard to keep her bolted firmly to the roof of the world. He then created land to imprison the waters of Tiamat and ensure they could never escape, 
by creating the oceans in the process. And with Marduk's total victory, Tablet 4 ends. 5 picks up with Marduk creating the world order, making temples for his favorite gods, placing the stars wherever suited him, marking out the days, and creating the annual calendar so that he could rule over time itself. He makes day and night, and clouds and rain, and the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, and a bunch of other stuff too damaged to read. Tablet 5, remember, is the one in bad shape. At some point, he hands over the Tablet of Destinies to An for reasons that are not immediately clear. But he does so as a bestowment from a greater god to a lesser. He disposes of all his battle captives, and the eleven fearsome beasts of Tiamat are reduced to statues to guard the Apsu Temple for all time. The gods are all quite happy, at least the ones on the winning side, and they threw a party for him and praised his name over and over. They name him again as King of Gods over heaven and earth and promise eternal submission. This, after all, is the real point of the story, to show that Marduk is supreme over all other gods, and in the same way, the followers of Marduk are supreme over the world. Marduk announces that he will build a great temple, and that he will bless the city of Babylon to be the greatest in the world, and there was much rejoicing. With Tablet 6, Marduk makes up his mind to perform miracles. So he performs the miracle of speaking to someone else and telling them to do stuff. Specifically, he calls down to Ea and says, I have a great idea. What if we made a race of slaves out of clay and blood and made them do all the work so that the gods could just have leisure time all the time? We will call this race humanity, and their lives will be terrible for our benefit. It will be hilarious. Ea says, this sounds like a great plan, except we need to find blood from someone first. Fortunately, they had a whole bunch of gods that had just been defeated in battle, all lined up and ready for a little blood donation. Marduk and Ea call together a big feast. The gods seemed to do nothing but quarrel and feast, and riled up all the lesser gods. Who, Marduk asks, started this war? It couldn't have been Tiamat, since women are incapable of such decisive action. And it certainly couldn't have been Ea, since even though he killed their grandfather and started everything, he was the good guy, so he couldn't possibly have started it. So it must have been Kingu who twisted Tiamat and forced her into evil actions. The lesser gods all roar their agreement, and out from behind the curtain comes Kingu himself, bound and naked in disgrace. Why is he alive when he was definitely counted among the dead gods two tablets ago isn't explained and doesn't really matter. Before a crowd driven to rabid bloodlust, the great enemy is executed and his blood collected to create the first humans. Then Marduk splits the ranks of gods in half, 300 for the heavens and 300 for the earth, and he hands out duties to each of them. After that, the gods asked, where should be the best temple for all them to hang out in? And Marduk said Babylon, and even though he had just invented humans to do all the heavy lifting, for the task of creating Babylon, he directed the gods themselves to bake the city's bricks. The Anunnaki, the high gods themselves, took to shoveling, and after a year of divine sweat and toil, the city of Babylon was raised. All the temples of Babylon were laid out according to however the audience listening to it would have been familiar with the layout of their own city. They then all took a break and went to a feast, where more destinies were handed out and more gifts were given. For the rest of the sixth tablet and all of the seventh, all of Marduk's fifty titles are read out by the gods and explained. All of these titles would have been super important back then, and if I really wanted to, I could probably do a whole nother episode on the significance of each and the little stories implied behind them. But honestly, my eyes glazed over after about three of them, so you can read them yourselves if you want. I will post a text version on today's post at oldeststories.net. But to get a little taste of the hymnal side of the work, let me read out the closing benediction of the epic. 
with fifty epithets, the great gods called his fifty names, making his way supreme. May they always be cherished, and may the older always explain to the younger. Let the wise and the learned consult together. Let the father repeat them and teach them to son. Let the ear of the shepherd and herdsman be open. Let him not be negligent to Marduk, the Elil of gods. May his country be made fertile and himself be safe and sound. His word is firm. His command cannot alter. No god can change his utterance. When he is angry, he does not turn his neck aside. In his rage and fury, no god dare confront him. His thoughts are deep. His emotions profound. Criminals and wrongdoers pass before him. Scribes write down his secret instructions, which older men recite for them and set them down for future men to read. May the people of Marduk, whom the gods created, weave the tale and call upon his name. In remembrance of the song of Marduk, who defeated Tiamat and took the kingship. Next week, we will continue to look at some of the new gods and stories that will come to shape the Semitic Sumerian mixed culture that now dominates Mesopotamia. Join us next time as we introduce some new faces and see familiar faces through a new cultural lens. Thank you for listening.